Hello, my name is Todd Lamley and welcome to the first dynamic update for my Cybex CCNA 7th edition uh, for July 2011. I've done many updates that you can find at lamley.com forward slash forum. On my forum you can find the errata there that I, I've listed, some error corrections that most of them have been fixed in the later printings of this new book. And as well as other things like how to study for the ICD-1 and ICD-2 using that book, as well as for the composite exam what's on the CD and how to use that material and how to get bonus material by contacting me. All that's listed on my form. But what this is about is I want to start doing some dynamic updates via audio and PowerPoints and then send you the notes so I can keep going. If anything ever changes that I feel is necessary for you to study, you automatically can come to my site and find it. Okay, uh, the first thing, so let's get going. Well, this update I wanted to do was about VPNs, but I decided to add a couple other things that I find that people are missing and then we'll finish up with VPNs. All right, so the first thing is, is console messages. In my chapter seven, I talk about Telnet and SSH. It's actually covered in chapter six and seven. Um, but we know that if we Telnet out to a device, um, in this simple example, Telnet 10.1.1.2, or you know we can just type the IP address, and we notice that we don't see a password prompt, but obviously we should be getting a username and password prompt there if we set it up right. And then um, we can type in terminal monitor to see console messages. That's a typical way to do it, and that terminal monitor command only works during that session. If we close our SSH or V2I telnet session, then that terminal monitor is no longer there because it's done from privilege mode. But what we can do is say, hey, we want to go ahead and look at messages. We just can't look at them right now. So I want to go ahead and log any console messages for, let's say I was doing a debug on a router for a complicated problem. So I would go ahead and use the logging host command from global config in the IP address of the syslog server. Now, if I wanted to make sure I, uh, that I knew the timing of various events, if I was debugging a complicated router issue and make sure I understood the relative time uh, to each of the timestamps or each of the entries, I would use the service timestamps log date time msec. The date time msec is not a variable, as you would think. It's saying go ahead and log this date time msec of these messages. Uh, so you'd have to make sure your router time and date is set correctly or be using an NTP server on your on your network. DHCP is found from page 94 to 96 so you can read those three pages. I have it in detail about the four-way handshake, how to create the pool. Uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention about conflict resolution. Um, the server pings the address before it hands out an address to make sure that it's not in use. If someone responds, obviously someone's using it. And if a host receives an address from a DHCP server, it uses a gratuitous ARP. It basically sends out, hey, who has the MAC address for this IP address? You know, sending out its own IP address. And if someone responds, you know, it goes, oh, well, obviously there's a duplicate. So it'll send it to the server. The server will mark that as a conflict with an X in the pool. You can see this. I've seen this many times, many times. And the ad address can't be used again until that is, that is fixed. Um, again, I'm just bringing these to your attention. These are inside the book, but just don't skip these as you're reading the chapters. IPv6, let's talk about this. Um, again, I'm not bringing anything that's not in my book, but I want to talk about the different address types. Make sure you're paying attention. It's really easy to skip over some details. There's type, different types of addresses. You have unicast. Same as with IPv4, where it's an address for a single interface. Um, except IPv6 has several types that you can read about. Multicast, one to many, just like with IP version 4. And we don't use any broadcasts inside uh, an IPv6 address. So we use something called an anycast. Now, they are not comparable. Uh, an anycast is way, way different. So an anycast is considered one to nearest. Um, so what you do is use this. Uh, typically, probably a good use of this would be in like a server farm. You have something like a server farm set up, and you would add the same address to all of the servers. For example, all using the content services. And the router then would then know about all these devices and deliver packets that would load bounce across these servers, uh, first using the closest devices that it can find based on percentage of uh, different things like uh, how much information and packets are being sent to each of the servers and load balancing. So notice what I have underlined here. One to nearest shares the same address on multiple devices. Router set on closest device. It's very important we understand um, any cast. Now some of the other things I want to bring up and please read about this in my chapter is about RIPNG. stands for RIP Next Generation. It is assigned globally and then placed on an interface. We don't put the network command underneath the global config command like we did uh, with RIP uh, version 1 and 2. The RIP-NG, again, is signed uh, 
to an interface. That's how RIP is used on interface, not via network command like we used to. Also, it's done by sent out using the multicast address FS02 colon colon 9 to send route updates between routers. Okay, so um, hopefully you're reading the notes that I'm sending along with this update that has that in there, FF02 colon colon 9 sends the updates. Now also, um, IPv6 doesn't do any broadcasting as I mentioned. It's auto-configuring or can be auto-configuring. So by default it will be. So what it'll do is the router will send out a 64-bit address for that link and the host will pick that up and it'll take the MAC address and insert 16 bits in the middle and those 16 bits are FFFE. This is called the EUI64 format. So remember, it goes in between the OUI and the unique identifier of the MAC address. Uh, that creates a 64-bit address and now every host has 120-bit bit, uh, auto configuration address or auto configuring address. So we can consider this plug and play. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't skip that when you're studying. One other thing I didn't want you to skip when you're studying OSPF um, is how to set your RID. Um, most of us, if you're studying OSPF or if you've gotten to that chapter, will know that the RID is the highest IP address on any active interface at the moment of OSPF startup. That's the default. You can override that with a loopback interface. But if you do that and you've already configured OSPF, then you have to reboot the router. Uh, the other way to do that is to... Uh, delete the OSPF database and rebuild it. But either way, uh, setting the loopback interface is a way to set your RID. The other way to do is here on the screen, and I took this right from page 477. So don't skip this section. This will override the highest IP address, override a loopback interface. The router ID is used first to create your RID. Okay, so we'll say router ID, put that in there, and then clear IP OSPF process. We don't have to reboot the router. Very sweet. Um, remember, this does not make you the designated router of your area. This just sets your RID. So what would make you high uh, designated router would be the highest RID or set in priorities on your router interface, whoever has the highest one. Uh, so read about router IDs uh, in OSPF and priorities to make sure you understand the difference between a router ID and a designated router. Those terms I use, you should know that. Okay, so let's talk about what we were going what I actually want to do this update about. And only have a few slides just to make sure you pay attention. So I only have four pages, 780 to 784, so I want to bring some things to your attention. First off, a VPN allows the creation, creation of private networks across the internet, enabling privacy and tunneling of non-TCPIP and TCPIP protocols alike. So, it, you know, it allows us to uh, give remote users and things like disjointed networks connectivity over a public medium, uh, like the internet, for example. <laughs> Great example there. All right, so in this case, instead of having point-to-point -point connections, we can create a virtual private network. Remember, a VPN by default doesn't give you any security. Uh, we are going to run something in there called IPsec. So we're going to have to encrypt the data before we send it out, which will cause overhead. So we'll have to be careful with that. I'll talk about that. IPsec provides, it, well, let's define IPsec. It's a framework of open standards that is algorithm independent. So it provides, um, it's a huge framework. It's not one protocol in itself. And provides this is what we need to define, really. And this is really what this was all about, providing data confidentiality data integrity and authentication. So the benefits of VPN again are cost. We don't have to have point-to-point -point communications. Uh, we can have point-to-multi-point. We can, we can have scalability. We can add, delete, add mobile users, branches, small, small office, home offices easily without changing any, any of the huge network, you know, a huge part of the network. And it gives us great security if configured correctly. Remember, by default, it won't. So we have to make sure that we configure this correctly. All right. Cisco isn't real big into talking about their different types of routers and IOSs and so on, but in this case, they like their ISR router and something called the Cisco ASA Adaptive Security Appliance that we can set up on a remote site to create for a branch office. We can use the ASA to give us IDS, IPS, and VPN connectivity. So if we also talk, I also talk about in my book about the different types of clients. So for, if we just had a remote user that was mobile, there's different VPN clients that I want you to look at. So IPsec, security services, confidentiality, data integrity, authentication. We also get anti-replay protection. So uh, confidentiality gives from encryption. Data integrity uh, verifies the receiver can was transmitted. The data was transmitted through the internet without being changed or altered in any way. And authentication makes sure that the receiver can authenticate the source of the packet. Okay, some of the encryption algorithms for confidentiality are DES, triple DES, RSA, and AES. 
And at this point, I want you to read about in my book the difference between asynchronous and synchronous. Asynchronous is better because the key uh, to decrypt it is different than the key to encrypt it, where synchronous means they're the same. Um, also, we have some different kinds of key exchanges. Uh, one of the most popular is something called Diffie-Hellman. This is the way that we're going to send a key from a client, uh, one side, sorry, source to a destination. So Diffie-Hellman 1 and 2. Diffie-Hellman 5, um, you can use these. Remember, the more you use these, the keys are larger. So the larger the key, um, the larger, the more RAM use on both sides, the more bandwidth between each other, and so on. Data integrity. Um, the hashing algorithms we use to get data integrity are HMAC, MD5, and the best is HMAC, SHA1. There's a 2 as well, but again, it's larger, and you have to match your processing, your RAM, and your bandwidth with your security needs. Make sure you're not over-securing it just uh, and not leaving yourself any bandwidth. Just pay attention to that, and that's not a CCNA objective, what I just said, but I've done IPsec a lot with VPNs, and I've noticed that you can overdo it. All right, so authentication. Don't forget we need authentication. So um, from remote office to the corporate office and back, so we can do peer authentication by using RSA signatures. And the IPsec security protocols. Uh, first off, we can authenticate the header uh, by encrypting it with authentication and integrity. This is called AH, or authentication header. And then in, uh, encapsulating or encrypting the payload that we have within the IP packet. So remember, uh, VPNs are layer two, but IPsec is layer three, if I haven't mentioned that. Um, and ESP provides the following encryption, authentication, integrity. So that's what we like. Uh, so remember, you can do AH-ESP when you're configuring IPsec. Uh, but the more you do, again, the more overhead that you're going to have. But that makes, you know, if you're just uh, configuring IPsec for fun, you want to give it the best that you have. So here's our different, um, you look at our framework here. And so we will choose one from each of these, IPsec protocol. ESP with, right, are we going to do with authentication header? So we want, or just authentication header. Are we going to do encrypt the header? Are we going to encrypt the data? Are we going to do both? DES, triple DES, or AES. Uh, AES is kind of a no-brainer today. MD5, SSA is better. Uh, and Diffie-Hellman, as we get higher in there, is the key. So that's the key exchange. Remember how we do the key exchange. It's very important. So let me go over some scenarios and some summary here. First off, HMAC, SHA1, and RSA are two data integrity algorithms that are commonly used in VPN solutions. Um, confidentiality, is, confidentiality is required when, uh, if it is required, the ESP IPsec security protocol should be used. Okay, so that makes sure ESP right here, so uh, encrypts what? The payload. Uh, so when we would use an ASA, when we want to install uh, a VPN at a branch office to manage an IPsec site-to-site -site VPN, and the data integrity component of VPN technology, we ensure that data is unaltered between the sender and recipient. The IPsec protocol suite is an open standard protocol framework that is commonly used in VPNs to provide secure end-to-end -end connections. And lastly, the authentication component of VPN technology ensures that data can be read only by its intended recipient. It probably seemed like I was reading what I just summarized, and that's true. And so if you look at the notes that I'm attaching, I'm going to send this audio um, with PowerPoint is along with the PowerPoint. So you can take a look and look at my notes that I sent. Okay, I want to keep this short and not too long. So I'm going to try to send as many updates as I can. Every couple weeks or so, hopefully, I'll send you an update. So this is Todd Lanley signing off for now. And study hard. And uh, please keep in touch and let me know how you do with your CCNA.